the money piece really woke up my senses to the latter, like how, how exploitative we've actually been globally and how much we are responsible for a lot of these dictators. I didn't quite understand that until I learned about the global monetary system. So uh, let's, let's move on to that. Um, you wrote a book uh, called Check Your Financial Privilege from last year. And in your book, you begin by stating that anyone born into a country with a reserve currency like the euro, the yen, the pound, or the dollar has a financial privilege relative to 90% of the world population born into weaker systems. Can, can you expand on that and, and carry on with what you were just saying? We often hear about check your privilege, right? And it's in a variety of contexts. I think that people need to check their financial privilege. That's the point of the book. What I realized as I checked my own privilege, as I learned about it, is that very few people on earth have the benefits we have as, let's just, as speaking as I guess to Americans here, um, about a billion people live in a liberal democracy that has property rights and a reserve currency, meaning that their governments can essentially print money to buy things abroad, like oil or industrial materials, etc. Um, and that allows them to have cushy kind of social programs. This is this is uh, one aspect. Obviously, we'll, we'll get, I'm sure, at some point into how this ties into fossils and access to fossils as well. But but the point is that um, only about a billion people live in societies where the their government has a currency that's strong enough where they can literally just print it and buy stuff. Now, the United, U.S. is the is the uh, obviously key example of this, the biggest example. We live in the world's first debt empire. Um, never before has there been a world empire that's been a, a debtor empire. Every other empire before the U.S. was a creditor empire. It, it, it owned stuff. It had a, a lot of assets. The United States' biggest export is, is debt. Um, and it's just unique. We've never seen this before. And it definitely coincides with the transition of the global monetary system from being based, being tied on to gold, something that's in the physical world, something that's scarce, to not being tied in gold anymore, to being tied to what we call fiat money, which is issued by decree. So you can kind of see this map out, and this is what I've spent a lot of time looking at. But the point being that in this day and age, there are a handful of nations that can that can sort of print these claims and buy things like oil, and then everybody else can't. So you have the other, whatever, six, seven billion people, and we're talking pre-2022 here, pre the Putin invasion of Ukraine, which which we'll get to, which has changed a lot of things, I think, and set a lot of things in motion. But when you had Bretton Woods and like Bretton Woods II, kind of these systems, um, we were very fortunate. And this allowed our countries to, to, to basically subsidize a lot of things in our societies. And our, think about the financial technology that we have. Like, it's just so easy for most Americans and Europeans to um, send money to each other, to spend money abroad, to use dollars in Africa or Latin America, people are happy to take them, uh, to uh, access capital markets, to, to invest in stocks, to, to, you know, hedge with all kinds of things. You know, the vast majority of the world's population has no access to that. Their local fiat currency sucks. The, their best bet at a savings technology is usually sheet metal or cattle. I'm talking for the majority of the world's population. They can't teleport money to anybody earth, on earth on demand. And they live a very different life. And and I think that I just didn't really quite grasp that until I took a look at it more closely. So there's really two two layers here of of financial privilege. One is the the salaries and GDP per capita and income that is the product of living in the global West on the backs of energy surplus. There's the actual wealth and income inequality issue. But the second is in parallel living in a country that has its own reserve currency, which makes access and commerce and money moving and all those things like seamless and easy and and we take it for granted yeah and again the us and the eu until recently had done a pretty good job on inflation for a long time and and you know people you can't really remember i mean you have to go back to the 70s to, to obviously right uh, your i'm sure your listeners commiserate i mean it's unprecedented what we're seeing now two years ago tons of people were telling me 
ah, inflation's impo- high inflation's impossible in Western society. Like this is literally what I think the economic orthodoxy thought. And guess what? They weren't humble enough. Like they didn't understand that it could happen here too. And I think it has happened here too. And I, I think our financial privilege is, is uh, temporary. It, it comes in waves. And by looking at what happened in the 70s, I think, I think we can learn a lot. You know, one thing that I thought was fascinating, taking a page from left leftist scholars and Marxist scholars, is that there's a lot of things you can say about just briefly going back to the Great Depression and why the Western world had this huge economic crisis. And obviously, there's a debate between the, the Keynesians and the Austrians about, well, is it because we left the gold standard or did we, did we not leave it soon enough, et cetera, et cetera, right? There's a third uh, argument, though, advanced by uh, the authors of this book called Capital and Imperialism, which is a, a terrific book. I don't necessarily agree with the conclusions, but it's 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 a really, really interesting read on history. And they quite simply argue that a lot of the crisis that the Western world faced at the end of the 20s and 30s was because the British Empire was collapsing. And, and you had the like center of the Western financial system lose access to cheap labor and goods that it had been accustomed to having for hundreds of plus years. This just makes so much sense to me. So that's like step one. Step two is when what the access to fossils themselves, decolon- you had deco- you know, decolonialization there, right? So you had oil access, which was traditionally managed by Western powers, at least for several decades, when oil first became a thing, Western companies, Seven Sisters, all that. And then you had like the, the OPEC nations actually take control. You had the power shift. Um, and guess what? That led to massive inflation in the West, right? So when we couldn't exploit the oil, the energy uh, for cheaper than the market value, um, no, any longer, we, we, we lost the ability to subsidize our nations and to subsidize our currencies. So I think this starts to map. You start to see this happen. Every time we pull, like the West pulls back from power over the rest of the world, we have economic crises. And this is so obvious in the 70s to me, like <laughs> literally like, you, you know, right as OPEC start to come into its own, they decide to raise the price of oil. The U.S. goes into an inflationary spiral. Nixon has to go off the gold standard. It set everything else in motion. So I've been fascinated by looking at this and also by looking at the reverse. What the U.S. does impacts everybody else. So we hear a lot about the Fed mandate, right? Um, the Fed has a mandate, low employment to keep, you know, to keep inflation and check these things. What people don't realize is what's not in the Fed's mandate is the livelihood of everybody else in the world. So both in the early 80s and and last year, when the Fed raised interest rates really fast, um, politically, right, to, to, to quell a domestic issue at home. In both cases, we had inflation out of control, right? So the Fed says, okay, we're gonna jack interest rates really fast. This absolutely crushes the global South, absolutely crushes. So in the 80s, you had the third world debt crisis, which caused the suffering of tens of millions of people, an uncountable number of deaths from starvation, lack of nutrition, et cetera, child malnutrition. And now you're seeing it again. In the last 18 months, you're seeing both economic and political collapse all across the global South currencies collapsing, the IMF having to come in and bail out countries, the government's being toppled. So I think what I've been really interested in is is looking at both how economic stability and our comfort and our quality of life, our way of life in the West, it relies on like resources elsewhere. And then also looking at how our decisions about how to retain stability and comfort and reduce inflation for for, 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 for the average person um, hurts other people. So it's this really interesting back and forth that I've been trying to trace out.